Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BioBus Student Town Hall Live. My name is David, and I am a scientist who worked uh, at BioBus. Um, OK, right off the bat, I want to first identify this mystery microscope image. Um, this picture is a close-up of a bird feeder magnified, oops, magnified 300 times. It was made using a cool image technique called differential interference contrast. Uh, we here at BioBus, we love to use microscopes. And if you don't know what BioBus is, we're an education nonprofit that builds scientific community by bringing research scientists and students together to discover, explore, and pursue science. We're based in New York City, where we operate, uh, where um, we operate two mobile laboratories, which you might have seen or have been on. Um, and there they are. And we also have one state-of-the-art community laboratory, uh, the BioBase in Harlem, off the one train. So come do some science with us when that space opens again. BioBus responded to the coronavirus pandemic by adapting everything virtually so we can still create an inviting and exciting space for everyone to come together, learn um, about biology, and make scientific discoveries. We have um, online lab classes called Discover at Home. We release a weekly science challenge called Explore at Home with different experiments for you to try. This week's is about building bridges. Plus, we have these student town halls every Thursday. And there's our website. Our next town hall will be all about animal behavior. And you can visit biobus.org backslash town hall to submit your questions for next week's scientists about animal behavior. Um, so please tell your friends and tune in next Thursday at 1 p.m. to learn something new. And you can learn about uh, all of these uh, at biobus.org. Check out the link in the description below. So today's topic is birds. And we have two wonderful, great scientists um, to answer all of our bird questions. Joe Santiago is a wildlife biologist and raptor specialist with the US Forest Service. And Rachel Roth is a naturalist at the Great Plains Nature Center. So Joe and uh, Rachel, welcome to the BioBus Town Hall. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, yourselves. Joe, why don't you go first? Okay, well, I'm Joe Santiago and you can't see him, but I'm gonna introduce you to uh, one of my raptors, and hopefully he'll say hello, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. That is a Merlin falcon, also known as a um, little blue corporal, also known as a pigeon hawk, and also known as my personal favorite, a bullet hawk. And uh, so anyway, we're here in West Virginia, and I'm originally from uh, Spanish Harlem in New York City. That's where I was born and grew up, and uh, in my later years, I started volunteering working with Birds of Prey. And uh, now I uh, have six uh, permanently injured Birds of Prey that I care for and actually live with, and I've been working with Birds of Prey for about 31 years now. And I also do rehabilitation, uh, and besides the education, I'm also a first responder for Birds of Prey and other migratory birds, and I've been doing that for 31 years as well. And, um, and that's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joe, for joining us. Um, and then we have Rachel. Rachel, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Rachel Roth. I work at the Great Plains Nature Center currently as a science communicator. And my background is in avian ecology. So I have a degree in wildlife management and ecology and birds are my absolute favorite. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here with you. I did bring a guest with me today. Oh, I was supposed to let you guys try to find him. Oh, well, well, I have a guest with me today. Um, our nature center, kind of like Joe, uh, we do uh, house permanently injured and orphaned wildlife that can't be returned to the wild. Um, so I have a one of our <laughs> program animals here with me today. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Is, Thanks for bringing in a guest. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the? About uh, yeah, I, I should tell you what he is. He's an Eastern screech owl. Um, he's a little bit nervous this morning. Uh, and as you can see, he's missing an eye. He was actually hit by a car. So he lost one of his eyes and that's why he can't be returned to the wild. His name is uh, Odin. <laughs> Look at 
other one. Thanks for joining us, Rachel, and thanks for joining us, Odin. Um, all right, and we also have uh, BioBuzz scientist Rosemary here in chat who will be collecting your questions. So um, ask anything you want to know in the chat. And Rosemary, um, can you introduce yourself and tell us something you love knowing about birds? Hi, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I am in the chat on YouTube. So if you have questions about birds, anything you want to know, put it in the chat and we'll ask the scientists. Something that I really love knowing about birds is actually that songbirds learn their song when they're little from other birds that they know and they have to practice it and practice it and sometimes they put their own spin on it. Yeah, love birds. Ask your questions. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, so you all submitted some amazing questions ahead of time uh, that I'll be asking uh, to our guest scientists. But remember, as Rosemary just said, we'll be taking um, questions from the chat. So if you're curious about something, put it in the chat so we can ask your question to our scientists. And be sure when you do that to tell us your name, age, and school. All right, so here are the rules. Scientists, you have about two minutes to answer each question. And if you start running out of time, my co-host, Thirsty Bird is gonna start making uh, an appearance across the screen. So when you see this bird coming across, um, you'll know it's time to wrap it up. And for Joe, who's joining us by phone, I've got a handy whistle that I hope won't deafen anyone on this call. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go. Um, our first question comes from um, Juanita, and this is for both Joe and Rachel. And the question from Juanita is, how do birds fly? Joe, do you want to start that one? I think that's Rachel's. Oh, sorry, Rachel. <laughs> sure, I can I can try to answer. So, um, one of the things birds do best is flying, um, and I'm not much of an engineer, so I don't know that I can answer a lot of the really specific engineering questions. But I can tell you that uh, birds have been flying in a lot of different ways from like the time birds existed and. There's been birds that glided, birds that had like a biplane with like four, four flying wings basically. And you know, today most of the birds we have are either just your standard flighted birds or your flightless birds, which is a derived trait. So the base trait for birds is that they can fly. Um, but you know, we'll talk about how birds can be so lightweight to help them fly, but really the secret is their feathers and those feathers can take on a lot of different shapes that allow lots of different strategies for flight, like slow moving gliders, um, seabirds that have really narrow but long wings. Um, the, the feathers are the secret and they form sort of the same shape that you'd expect on an airplane wing that allows for lift and powered flight. Cool, thank you. Um, this next question comes from Luann. This one's for you, Joe. Um, and Luann asks, why do some birds fly and others don't? And um, why can't all birds fly? <laughs> okay. Um, that, that, that so last one the, second, the second question is actually pretty much the, the same as the first. And um, you have to remember in nature, it, nature always makes sense. So whenever you have a question about something, immediately go back, fall back to that. Nature makes sense. So what makes sense here? Uh, in the case of a, of a penguin, does it make sense that a penguin should be able to fly? No, right? It, it spends its time underwater. It makes sense that it should swim because that's what it needs to do to survive. So, and also, you know, flying takes up a tremendous amount of energy. And there's birds out there that, uh, you know, their, uh, their physical uh, being is heavy, heavier and doesn't, isn't conducive to, to a lot of flight because it would take too much energy, you know? And, and that has to do with evolution. I hope that answered the question. It certainly did. Um, and I, okay. have an, uh, I have another question for you, Joe. This one comes from Hannah. Um, and Hannah asks, how many different types of birds are there? There's about 10,000 species worldwide. Ah, great. A lot. Um, thank you. And I hope that clearly answers your question. Um, this next one is for Rachel. Um, and Rachel, this question is asked by Lucas. Why are birds so light? So I guess why is kind of a, a two-part question. So mainly they, they evolve those traits in order to aid their flight. Um, and the way that they do that, the, the physical why is 
um, very efficient. So they're they're uh, missing, you know, organs that come in pairs. They're often missing one of those to make their bodies a little bit more efficient and lightweight. Also, their bones are hollow, which I think a lot of us are aware of. Um, this is a goose bone, which you can actually I've dremeled a hole in it so that you can kind of see um, that it is in fact hollow inside. And there's kind of a lattice work in there to make them strong so that they're still rigid and, and strong. But what's interesting about that is that, do you know, like why their bones are hollow? Um, it's for the same reason that we have hollow bones in our faces. It's connected to their lungs. So their lungs actually infiltrate the bones. There's a hole up here on the goose bone. I did not drill that. That's the hole that the bird's lungs actually go into the bones. Um, so unlike every other animal on the planet, um, they have air filled, air filled bones throughout their entire body and not just in their face. Like we have sinuses. So if you can imagine, I think somebody asked this later on, um, if birds can get colds, yes. And it's really bad because their lungs are literally inside all of their bones too. So you can imagine that would be a really nasty cold. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that the lungs infiltrate um, the bones. Um, thank you for that. All right, so um, our next question uh, is for Joe. And this is coming from Grace. And the question is, what are talons for? What are talons for? Uh, talons are used for a number of things. Uh, one is primarily catching and killing prey. Another would be, they use them for grooming. They use them in self-defense because uh, birds of prey, they understand that while they're hunting something, something is hunting them. So they need to be able to defend themselves at all times. They use them for gripping perches, for moving nesting materials, uh, for holding their uh, food down once they, you know, they kill their food, dispatch it. They need to be able to hold it down to the perch or whatever substrate they're on so that they can actually get a good hold of it with their beaks and rip it apart. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. This next question um, for Rachel is coming from Frankie. And Frankie asks, why do birds move differently, more jerky and quicker than mammals? And that's such a good question. Like, it's such a good question because it's one of the reasons why animators in films have such a hard time animating birds correctly because they just don't move like anything else. And I think probably the there's a couple of answers there. One is that, um, birds are very fused. So like here's here's a pelvis and a tailbone and the spine of a goose. So they've got a lot of pieces that are rigid. So they really can't be as fluid like a cat or something where they can arch their spine around. Um, also their eyeballs are fixed into place. So uh, they're often moving like their heads really quickly the same way we would move our eyes very quickly to look around. Um, and then the other component of that is that they're just so light that it doesn't take any energy to make a quick jerky movement. So all of those things combined allow them to move like in a really quick, like flitting sort of way. Thank you. And so th this next question is for you, Joe. Um, and it comes from Mikale, uh, who asks, why do birds chirp? Why do they chirp uh -huh. and fly around cats? And is it a danger signal? Okay. Uh, well, birds uh, chirp or um, vocalize for a number of reasons. It, it could be to, uh, to convey information such as annoyance, uh, fear, uh, warning, uh, calling a mate, uh, communicating to young, uh, and um, how they're feeling. You know, they can convey how they're feeling, annoyance or anything like that. Uh, why do they chirp and fly around cats? <laughs> well, <laughs> they recognize that cats are uh, a danger, and so they're, that's, that's a warning. Um, they're, they're conveying annoyance, fear, and it's a warning to other birds in the area uh, that there's a, a danger present. And they're probably trying to sc scare the cat away as well. So is it a danger signal? Yes, it is. It can be. It can be. Not always, but it can be. Thank you. This next question is for Rachel. It's from Kaiden, uh, who asks, what is the slowest bird on earth? And these, these like slowest, fastest, heaviest questions are kind of difficult because it's like, by what metric? But so technically, 
um, the birds that can fly the slowest. There's a couple of them. Uh, there are things like the American woodcock, which if you've ever seen those viral videos of the bird that kind of like whoop, bounces around and uh, dances as he is walking, he's a little bit nervous, I apologize. Um, that bird uh, can fly at like five miles an hour without stopping, but there's a lot of birds that can hover in place too. And it's a hard question to answer, but but those guys are pretty good at flying very slowly during their mating displays. Um, also, here's a nice close-up look at Odin. Thank you, sir, for that. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, so how about we have some questions from our chat now. Um, Rosemary, do you have any questions from us? For us, I, rather? I do. I have about three good questions. Um, so Ife, who is now 12.99 years old and homeschooled, uh, wanted to ask, when you were talking about chirping earlier, humans think that different birds say tweet, chirp, squawk, etc. But what do birds think humans say? Do you know? <laughs> well, I can, um, you know, I can tell you from my own experience of working with my raptors for so many years, that they actually um, learn, just like we learn a language from, uh, lang languages are actually just, just groups of, of sounds that we recognize to mean certain things. And so they can pick up on that as well. Because I've, the birds I've worked with, I repeat, I repeat sounds for certain things and I'll point. And now I can just say, do you want to eat? And I don't use food as a prompt. I don't do any of that. I just do it on a repeated basis, on a repeated basis, and show them what I'm talking about, just like you teach a child. And they respond to that. You know, I can say to my, my Merlin, Zacchaeus here, now he's not going to do it right now, but when he's hungry, I could say, Zacchaeus, you want to eat? And he knows what that means. And he'll start screaming, screaming, screaming until I give him something to eat, you know? So, uh, um, so yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that was a really good answer for the question. Okay. Um, okay, so the second question from the chat comes from Foley, who's 10, and they want to know how many species of non-flying birds are there? Rachel, do you have an idea? Yeah, well, I don't know the, the numbers exactly, but there's not quite as many as you'd think. A lot of the non-flying birds are birds that evolved in island settings where they lost their ability to fly. So there's some famous flightless parrots and, and other birds in places like New Zealand that historically didn't have many ground-dwelling mammal predators. Um, and then of course, penguins are not flighted anymore. They have very dense bones. And you're probably familiar with some of those large, um, like ostrich, rhea, uh, emu type birds, which uh, are kind of like the horses of the bird world. Um, but, but there's not a, a whole lot, like probably a lot of the ones you, you're familiar with are, are the bulk of our non-flying birds. Are you okay, pal? <laughs> um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> very, very cool, thank you. Um, last one for this round. How many birds of prey are there? This one comes from someone who's just going by the handle swift cloud, but a swift is a kind of a bird. So they're on <laughs> um, Joe, do you want to take this one? Yeah, there's, there's approximately uh, 430 species. Wow. All right. Thank you um, to our um, to our friends who are submitting um, questions in our chat. If you're just joining us, um, uh, you can submit your um, questions to our two scientists uh, live in our chat box. And, and when you submit your question, don't forget to add your name, age, and school. Um, okay, so we have some more questions for our scientists. Um, this one's for Rachel and it comes from Marina. Uh, Rachel Marina asks, I have heard that birds are the closest ancestors to dinosaurs. Is that true? Okay, you guys might have to like pull me off the stage for this one, but um, kind of you've got it backwards. So, so birds are the uh, last living dinosaurs actually. And um, I've got some images I'll share with you <laughs> to help illustrate this. Um, but here's our, our family tree and uh, crocodiles are the closest living relative to birds right now, but birds are literally a part of the dinosaur branch. They're theropod dinosaurs. So um, let me see. 
I've got to get to my actual presentation so I can change slides. But yes, so um, these guys are literally dinosaurs. Um, in fact, there's a group of dinosaurs called pair avian dinosaurs, which literally means they're close to birds. So these are the dinosaurs closest to birds and include things like velociraptors. Um, beautiful illustrations. <laughs> These guys uh, also have a lot of in common with dinosaurs in terms of pigments. Like we, we literally know the colors of some of their feathers. So like this little guy, Anchiornis, um, this is his foot, by the way, literally a bird foot, amazing. Um, we know his feathers and this is literally what he looked like. Those were the actual feathers on that guy. We have amber specimens of dinosaurs, both avian and non-avian. Here's a wing from an actual dinosaur. Um, with a little claw. Here's a little toothed bird called Enantiornithes. It, this is a little baby, like a little fledgling, really cute. So that's a toothed bird, which is very close to dinosaurs. And we even have a dinosaur tail preserved in amber, which is literally just like a feathered bird. It's, it's a dinosaur tail, but it is a, a dinosaur. So the, the line between them is so blurred that it's really impossible to say where a dinosaur ends and a bird begins. Um, because they're literally the same thing. There's a really good quote by Mark Nolan that dinosaurs didn't go extinct. We just call them birds now. And uh, I mean, that's the answer. They, they are dinosaurs in every sense of the word. Yeah. They are literally theropod dinosaurs. Dinosaurs had hollow bones. Dinosaur had bird, dinosaurs had bird lungs in their bones. Even sauropods, the long necked dinosaurs had bird style lungs inside the bones of their neck vertebrae. So like even the non bird looking dinosaurs had traits in common with birds that no other animal on the planet has. Rachel, thanks for clarifying that. I hope my, I hope my nephews are watching this because they would flip out over that. <laughs> um, and we have, a, we have a related question for you, Rachel. Um, and this comes from Joe. Why did birds survive, but not dinosaurs? Yeah, so I guess um, technically, just some of the dinosaurs survived. Um, and the, the ones that did survive were mostly smaller animals and animals that were ground dwelling, like uh, grouse, chicken-like dinosaurs or, or uh, theropods, and uh, some water dwelling like goose and, and uh, duck relatives too. So those guys survived. And that's pretty common when you look at other animals that survived the extinction event. They tended to be much smaller. So really it's just the larger, like proper dinosaurs that that went extinct and uh, their smaller relatives went on to inhabit our parking lots. So the next time you see a grackle in a parking lot, uh, give it a wink and say, you're a dinosaur. That's cool. I will be doing that, I promise. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> All right, um, this next question um, is for Joe and it comes from Amy. And Joe, Amy asks, are birds smart? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, birds solve problems. They make tools. Um, in, a, in a situation, I'll just give you a little bit, a, a, a very short story here. I was working with some parrots, and um, <laughs> I was talking to this one parrot uh, that had quite a vocabulary. And I said, okay, um, I'm, Flipper, I'm going to go downstairs now, and, um, and I'll be right back. And he said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And here's another one, the same bird, the same bird, okay? So I'm next to his cage and I'm reading. And he kept saying, hello, hello, hello. He wanted my attention, okay? And, you know, I was absorbed in, in what I was reading, and so I, I, I didn't pay attention. So he comes closer and he goes, hello, and he says it louder and louder and louder. I didn't respond. I'm still reading, right? He comes closer and he whispers, hello, and I responded. Now, he wasn't taught that. Amazing. He tried different means to get my attention, and he succeeded. I mean, that's, that's my answer. Getting smart. That's just, that's just one of many stories, but that's my answer, yeah. Um, I think you could maybe gather those stories to make a book out of it, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this next question is for Rachel, um, and it comes from Chosen, uh, who asks, how did they evolve into what they are now and um, what their prey means about who the bird is as a bird? Yeah, and I think what you're trying to say is um, that 
a lot of what you learn about birds and their evolution has to do with their feeding mechanisms. And so when you look at like uh, a bird of prey, they've got a sharp hooked beak and, and a lot of that is what we look at. But I think that kind of highlights something really cool about birds, which is that in general, they, they are so similar, like from an ostrich to a hummingbird, they, they are all walking on two legs. They all have beaks that they use to eat. Um, and, and so it's, they all have like the same number of toes for the most part. And so it's really easy to look at the really small differences and how they've evolved to figure out like um, what makes them that bird. And uh, a lot of what a bird has to evolve to do is to eat its food. And so um, if you look at birds that have like sharp pointy beaks, they're either using it to like spear things or to use really delicate grabbing motions. Um, and that's really cool because you can learn a lot about a bird and make a lot of inferences about a bird you've never seen before just by observing things like its beak shape. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Joe. Um, Hannah asks, how do mama birds feed their young? Well, that depends on the age of the young, and, and that's going to change how the approach that they take is going to change as the, as the young uh, grow and get older. Uh, for instance, um, the, the, like in raptors, uh, the food is going to be torn into much, much smaller, smaller pieces when the birds are very young. Uh, birds can also regurgitate the food that they've already eaten into the, so it's kind of like a cereal, <laughs> like a problem cereal type of thing that they regurgitate into the mouth of the young. As the birds get older, uh, say, you know, um, uh, songbirds might bring, you know, uh, crickets or whatever it is that they're going to eat to the nest. And inst instead of regurgitating them, they'll, they'll leave them there for the older chicks to get the idea of how to, you know, how to uh, eat those things. And the same thing with raptors. Thank you. But not with crickets. I mean, you know, with, with prey, right. like, you know, uh, such as um, mammals. All right. Um, this next question is for Rachel. Uh, and it comes from Tiago, who asks, what colors can birds see? And can they see normal colors like humans? This is, oh, this is so cool. OK, so yes and no, um, birds can see every color that we can see for the most part. Some nocturnal birds like the screech owl have lost a little bit of their color uh, seeing ability. I think that their color vision is very similar to dogs and cats, but all birds can see additional colors that we cannot see. Um, they are sensitive to UV light, which is a type of wavelength, kind of like, you know, my purple shirt looks purple because it's reflecting purple wavelengths of light back at us. So birds see UV light reflected back to them. And I've got kind of an image of what that looks like here. Um, yeah, here's a few examples of that. So we can actually make uh, UV sensitive patches of feathers visible to our eyes through different techniques. There's a fluorescent puffin beak. Um, we've got the underside of a northern saw wet wing, which, okay, this is really cool. Um, a lot of owls, because they are out at night and UV light is in the moon, um, they can see UV light too. And this screech owl also has bright pink magenta armpits. We have taken both of our screech owls, gray morph, red morph, into a dark room, protected their eyes, and shined a black light on them. And their armpits glow magenta, like hot pink. Um, so birds see things a lot differently than we do. And some birds use that to hunt prey because uh, things like urine reflect a lot of UV light. So they see urine trails from rodents like a different color. Birds are also sensitive to uh, polarized light. So birds kind of have built-in sunglasses that are polarized. You can think of it that way. It makes them really good at sensing which direction the sun is at when they're using those patterns to migrate. And it helps birds that eat fish see through the glare on the water uh, in order to hunt fish. So birds have just incredible vision. And that's one of the hallmarks of that group. Oh, amazing. I want that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. this a little bit more about uh, bird vision. Um, these are for Joe. Joaquin asks, um, I want to know how birds see in the dark. And Amy follows up um, with another question, but why don't you answer that first one and then I'll follow up with Amy's question. Okay, uh, not all birds see equally as well in the dark. Uh, and it's kind of tied into, you know, I can answer that with the, the owl uh, question as well. So they don't all see as well in the dark. Like for instance, um, 
uh, daytime diurnal birds, and daytime birds of prey especially, see exceptionally well in the daytime because they have uh, a very high concentration of photoreceptors in their fovea. Uh, fovea's are are places on the retina that are kind of like these um, concentrated concentrated places. They're little indentations on in, on the retina. It's a focal point, and there's a very high concentration of rod and cone cells in those fovea areas. Very high. So birds of prey have uh, their their uh, their rods and cones are extremely uh, concentrated there. In fact, I think they have, like, uh, as opposed to a humans in that area, we have about 100,000. They have a million. And so uh, they, can, they can also, it's hard to ex explain in a very simplistic way, but the, they, they're very sensitive to light, and the way the light comes in, they're, they're able to see to, to see, uh, that's how they're able to see a lot more colors with much more acuity than we can. However, owls, owls have a very um, concentrated abundance of uh, rod cells. So rod cells look like little uh, fluorescent tubes. And rod cells are very sensitive to picking up light, very sensitive. They have fewer cone cells. Cone cells are, are, are receptors for color. But those rod cells are, uh, pick up light, so they have a very high concentration of those. So they're very, very sensitive to just, they can maximize the use of very, very little light. Um, I, I read somewhere a long time ago that a great horned owl can hunt, successfully hunt a mouse in a football field size area with the light of one candle and successfully do that. Yeah. So, um, so that's, it, it's in the structure of the eye. And the amount of rod and and uh, cone photoreceptors that they have. Thank you for that um, vivid description, Joe. Um, I, I think we should take some questions from our chat. Um, Rosemary, do we have any questions lined up for our guests? We do. Okay, two questions. One from Anna, who's 28 and a lifelong learner, wants to know. How do you know when you, oh, I'm sorry. How do you know when a wild bird who seems hurt or alone actually needs help and when it's okay on its own? Joe, can you answer that? Uh, yeah, yeah, a, a really good indicator. You know, wild birds, uh, if, if they're okay, they're gonna try to get away from you. I mean, that's just their, their nature. Uh, they look at everything that's, that's strange, that's not natural to their world as possible danger. So if you can approach a bird, you see a bird and it's, and it's down on the ground and it's not moving and it's, you slowly approach, it stays there, there's something wrong with that bird. There's something wrong. Um, now, uh, occasionally, you know, um, I'll get people who call in, say, like a screech owl, and they'll say, well, I picked up a screech owl on the side of the road and it's really tame. <laughs> And I said, no, it's not tame. It probably has a, a nice headache from a concussion. And as soon as, if it should snap out of that, you're going to find out how not tame it is. <laughs> so, yes, yes. If, if, you, if you see abnormal behavior, there's something wrong. If, if a wild bird, uh, a wild animal of any kind, does not respond, doesn't leave, you know, a situation where it's feeling threatened, um, there's something wrong. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you for that really helpful advice too. Um, all right, second question is from Joaquin, who is 11.7. Our students really go very mathematical in their age. Um, it's awesome. So they wanna know, how do birds find their way home? Rachel? Yeah, that's a great question. And because birds are so visual, a lot of it is landmarks. And that goes for migration too, which I know we're gonna talk about next, um, but, they, they use landmarks. Um, a lot of birds will uh, use the sun to navigate longer distances. Um, but in terms of just moving around their habitat, it's all just building a map in their minds and then flying around based on those landmarks. So it can be a little difficult for birds if the landscape is constantly changing. <laughs> all right, thank you, Rachel. Um, if you're just joining um, our BioBus Student Town Hall, my name is David. I'm here with scientists Rachel and Joe, and we are taking your questions about birds. 
Um, all right, so this next question is for Rachel. Samira asks, why do birds migrate? What kinds of things affect bird migration? Right, so um, birds migrate mostly for one of a couple reasons, either food or daylight. For example, there are some tropical species from South America that migrate up to North America, um, not because of food resources, because there's plenty of food in the tropics, but because we have longer daylight hours during their nesting season. And those birds raise more young, um, almost twice as much young than the ones that stay in South America. So that's, an, that's a really good reason. Um, also, a lot of birds have higher food availability for their chosen like insect diets in different regions across time. And things that affect migration, um, I think we need to know like what exactly birds use to migrate. So um, some birds migrate at night and they actually use the stars to navigate. So if they're not able to fly above the stars or if there's weather patterns that interrupt them, that can be a huge effect. Um, often when there's big storm systems moving through, a lot of little warblers and smaller birds will kind of drop out of the sky in front of that storm. Um, things like snowfall obstructing landmarks can affect them. And for certain birds, it's a little different. Like uh, there's an experiment a long time ago on pigeons that found that on cloudy days when they can't use the sun to navigate, they're able to use electromagnetic fields in the earth, like an internal compass to actually navigate. So if it's cloudy, pigeons can still find their way around because they can use their internal compass to do it. Um, so those are the things generally that affect bird migration. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and we have a related question. This one's for Joe. Mackenzie asks, do all birds migrate? Uh, no, all birds do not migrate. Uh, some birds are known as what's called complete migrants, which means they all migrate. Others are partial migrants, which means some stay put for the winter and some go. And then there's a third group, which is called eruptive migration. And that means um, the pattern is there is no pattern. Some, some years they go, they all go. Some years some go and some don't. There's just no pattern. It's, it's not a predictable thing. And Joe, we have a follow-up question. Um, why do birds fly south for the winter if they have feathers? And that comes from Cecil. Well, you know, here's the thing. They don't, they don't always fly south. <laughs> I know people think that, but that's not always the case. Migration is a very complex thing. Uh, they can, sometimes migration is east to west. Sometimes it's in altitude. You know, uh, not all birds fly when they migrate. Some walk. <laughs> and you might ask why that is. It's because, uh, you know, and birds are very conscious about um, save, saving energy. It's, it's an energy game out there. So, so uh, if it's, and, and flying is very expensive concerning energy. So I think it's some kind of... Uh, um, grouse, don't quote me on that, but I think it's some kind of grouse that actually walks when it migrates. Interesting. I've never heard of that. It's very cool. Thank you, Joe. Um, and uh, one You're more welcome. for you. This one's from Eric. How do birds stay warm during the winter? How do birds stay warm during the winter? Well, they have feathers and they have a the feathers that you see are, are the outside feathers are actually just one kind of about five or six different kinds of feathers. And the different feathers have different functions. And uh, way underneath uh, um, way underneath the contour feathers are down feathers. Uh, and then there's semi-plume and there's all kinds of feathers. Anyway, so they fluff them up to trap warm air between the feathers and that'll help keep them warm. They also look for uh, places in the canopy where uh, the brush is heavy enough, or may maybe there's coniferous trees, to help block the, uh, the elements, the wind, and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And this next sure. question is for Rachel. Brianna asks, can different birds from different regions adapt to new regions? Yeah, and so um, adaptation is usually more of like an evolutionary term, but uh, in terms of like, um, like a short-term adaptation, that's certainly true too. That's why we have several birds that are actually invasive species that are not from our uh, region or our continent even. Um, some really well-known ones I know you guys have seen before are house sparrows and Eurasian starlings. Um, there's also like the Eurasian collared dove that's 
been sweeping across our country and now is found like across the entire continent, which is great. Um, and so those birds just found a niche here that they were able to exploit and uh, sometimes to the detriment of the species that were already here, but they were able to find a home here and make it work for them pretty easily. So, and if you think about migration, you know, uh, in that like single species moving back and forth during its lifetime, um, you have birds that are trying to scope out places in the Arctic or birds that live in Kansas and then fly to Argentina during their winter months here in Kansas. So uh, yeah, bird, birds are great at finding uh, ways to exploit their niche in new environments. Thanks, Rachel. Um, we have our next question from Joe to Joe asking, why don't birds get electrocuted when on wires? And also, are birds in cities different from those in less urban areas? Well, actually, unfortunately, birds can get electrocuted. <laughs> uh, but just in short, okay, electricity is a lot like water in that it flows using the least amount of resistance. Uh, in electrical power lines, electricity flows along copper wires, and that copper is a good conductor of electricity because it allows it to flow easily along its surface. Now, a bird is uh, made up of cells and tissues, and these cells and tissues don't provide the electricity in the wire with an easy route to travel. Uh, and because it's not a good conductor of electricity, the electricity ignores the bird on the wire and continues to travel along the copper wiring because that's the easiest mode of travel, okay? But, so that's why you see birds on a single wire and they, you know, they're okay. However, birds can get electrocuted uh, if they happen to touch the wire and certain other objects at the, uh, touch another wire and certain other objects at the same time. Like, for instance, uh, like uh, if they touch... Uh, an electrical grounding wire or a second wire carrying another voltage, the voltage difference causes a current flow through the bird between the two wires. And then the bird is going to experience uh, electrical shock and uh, um, uh, harm or possibly death. Um, are birds in cities different from those in less urban areas? Uh, well, you know, just... I'd, I'd say there are. I'd say their behavior is going to be uh, affected because uh, the birds in cities are somewhat desensitized to noise, to activities, uh, than birds that are not used to that. Yeah. Um, like somebody that I, I know has a tundra peregrine. And tundra peregrines uh, basically have little or no fear of humans because uh, there aren't many humans where they uh, live, where they grow up and live. So, uh, so they tend to be a lot more docile ar around people because they, they don't know them to be uh, dangerous. So that, that, and that's a very different behavior than the peregrines that you would find elsewhere. I see. Thank you, Joe. This You're next welcome. question is for Rachel. Uh, Jesse asks, what can I do uh, to help birds not run into windows? Yeah, so usually when birds are running into windows, it's because they think that they can fly through them. Um, and also because like sometimes during the breeding season when they're a little bit more like hyped up about beating each other up when they see like a rival in the reflection of the window. Um, there's a couple of things you can do. You can leave blinds down covering the window, like you can leave them open or something, but anything that obstructs the view into the window and makes them realize they can't fly through it can help. Um, you can also try to get rid of their reflection in some way by covering the windows. I've heard of people putting Vaseline on the windows to make it kind of cloudy and not as reflective or even like putting little streaks of that through there on the window. Um, just anything you can do to make the reflection not as bad will help. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, we now have some uh, questions from our chat. Um, why don't we, pa I'll pass it to Rosemary. Rosemary, do you have some questions for us? I do. Um, so Carlene, who is 28 from Vanderbilt University asks, where do birds go during really poor weather, like hurricanes? 
That's a great question. And uh, a lot of birds can sense those storm cells coming. They're really sensitive to those environmental changes. And so a lot of them just leave <laughs> before it actually gets to them. Um, but you know, in general, in bad weather, if it's pretty bad, birds will just find some little spot they can hunker down. They'll just try to ride it out and then emerge again when, when they're able to. And so birds are certainly affected by storm events the same way that a lot of other animals are. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and then my second question coming from the chat is from Taylor who is 14 and goes to special needs high school and says, Joe, can you talk about eagles, please? Um, we don't have a specific question, just thinks they're beautiful. <laughs> and can you share some fun facts with us? Yeah, I sure can, I sure can. Um, I've had, uh, I've, I've uh, uh, been blessed with uh, um, being able to take care of a rehabilitated uh, bald eagle. His name is Freedom. And uh, this July, we celebrate five years together, and he is on loan, actually, from the American Eagle Foundation in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And when I first uh, adopted e uh, Freedom, so to speak, and brought him here, I had someone who um, had 40 years' experience as a falconer tell me, don't expect to have a relationship with that bird. That bird really hasn't, uh, um, you know, interacted well with people. It's very aggressive. It's attacked some people. It, it's already set in its ways. It has bad habits, so on and so forth. And um, I'll tell you, I brought uh, Freedom home. And yes, he did try to attack me probably every day for three months total. But, uh, but I persisted in treating him with respect and compassion and consideration. And I was persistent in that. And uh, now he considers me his mate. And he treats me like a mate. He brings me sticks. He flies into my fist. I don't weight manage him, which means I don't ever withhold food from him, ever. So these are not behaviors that are related to uh, any kind of uh, stimulus, you know, like like I'm going to give him something in, in exchange. He just started doing this. And uh, he preens my hair. He preens my hair. He paws, gently paws my feet. He engages in play with me. We play. And uh, every time he, uh, he does something, I'll say, like, for instance, when I arc the water hose over his, per over his big perch, you know, I clean out his enclosure with a, a water hose. And so when I arc it, I'll say, freedom, jump it, jump it, jump it. And now he, he knows, jump it. Okay, we're going to play. So he jumps back and forth over the arc of water. And I'll say, freedom, home. And he knows that he's, he comes right on my arm, on my fist. We're going to go outside to look over the mountain view that I have here. He'll sit on my fist for up to two hours, preening himself, preening my hair, uh, just checking out what, with one foot up to his chest, to, just checking out uh, you know, everything that's going on. I gave him a couple of egg replicas, and he immediately started building nests inside his, and I brought in loads of sticks, and he immediately started building nests in his enclosure. And I help him do that. I move sticks. He moves sticks. I turn the eggs every day, as they normally would do in the wild. He watches everything I do, as a male would in the wild to the female, and then he has the final say. After I'm finished turning the eggs, then he'll come and turn them again. When I'm finished putting the sticks you know, in, in, in a place that I'll have them, he'll come and fix them. I give him sticks. He flies around with them, places the, the sticks in the nest. And I could go on and on and on with the different things that I've experienced with this amazing creature. Uh, so, and, and that just goes to, to show that uh, not all the uh, people who think they know everything know everything. In fact, uh, people who think they know everything don't. <laughs> Nobody does, you know. Thank you for that. So that's, uh, that, that's just a few of the amazing stories uh, about, uh, about freedom. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, if, you're, if you're joining us, um, our BioBus Student Town Hall, my name is David, and I'm here with uh, two scientists, wildlife biologist Joe Santiago and naturalist Rachel Roth, who um, study birds. And we want to hear your questions. What do you want to know? Put them in the chat and we'll ask them to our scientists. Um, all right, so Joe, I have a question for you from Juanita. Why do birds sing? Uh, why do, 
why do birds sing? For many reasons, many reasons. Uh, to attract, they could be singing to attract a mate and court the mate. Uh, they could be singing to uh, sound an alarm. They could be singing uh, to um, uh, or or making vocalizations um, to uh, actually to convey to uh, danger. Uh, th- there's a number of reasons why they do that to to convey ownership of the territory. Um, uh, and I, I'd venture to say, this is not exactly scientific, but I'd venture to say they probably sing because they just feel good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I have a question for Rachel from, uh, this comes from Joe. Can one species of bird understand other species? Yes, and they are constantly listening to each other. And so, for example, uh, we're all probably familiar with the chickadees call, chickadee dee 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 dee. That's not really a song, it's, it's a, uh, territorial like a aggression call and we know as scientists the more d's there are in that call the more upset the chickadees are and there's several birds that we kind of call lovingly the alarms of the forest and uh so here's one example of when a chickadee is sounding those alarms it will rile up the entire forest of birds and they'll kind of grab their metaphorical torches and pitchforks and kind of go like mobbing around some other uh, threat that they've found. So birds are constantly eavesdropping on each other and we're documenting that more and more. I'll also point out that a lot of female birds sing too. So we commonly think that males are the ones singing, but the females also sing, they do wet. And so there's a lot of listening that goes on in the forest in addition to singing and calling. Thank you. Um, I love the idea of different bird species vocalizing to each other. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Joe, this question is for you and it's coming from Angelina who asks, how can we distinguish between different bird calls and why are they all so different from each other? Okay, to distinguish between different bird calls, what I recommend is to go online to a Cornell Lab of Ornithology or, or one of the uh, you know, well-known uh, avian sites and listen carefully to maybe, to maybe um, one or two of the common bird calls, of the most common bird calls, and get to know those calls and then go outside and listen to that and really listen. Just do one or two, you know, every day, every other day. And, and that's how you learn. That's how you learn to distinguish between the different ones. And sometimes the, the differences are very, very subtle. And so you have to really, that's a good way to develop listening uh, skills is learning bird calls. And why are they all so, so different from each other? Uh, well, remember, we're going to go back to nature makes sense. What if they were all the same? Mm-hmm. There'd be a lot of confusion out there, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's very cool. So that actually brings us to um, a challenge that we are going to try here for the first time on the town hall. So we have some recordings of some birds from the Smoky Mountains, and I'm going to play them. And uh, we want to see... Joe and Rachel, can you pick out any of the birds here? Okay, are you ready? Everyone else, sure. are you ready? G- gotta listen. Here we go. Peter, 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 Peter. It's a titmouse. Tufted titmouse. I hear that. How many birds do you think there were in that clip? Sounded like there was a flock <laughs> of birds chatting and I don't know if they were like wax wings or starlings more likely or something, but probably a lot. <laughs> Thank you for doing the, the call. I think now if I hear it, I can pick it out again later. So see if you at home can hear some birds and pick out some birds from the the environment around you. All right, David, more questions? Uh, Sure. Um, All right, we have a question for Rachel that's coming from allaboutbirds.com. That's how they identified. Um, Where can I find out information on a bird that I'm curious about? 
Oh, so um, there's like three places I'll tell you to look. Allaboutbirds.org, which is uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and they have some of the best bird tools. So uh, they also make an app called Merlin Bird ID, which is a pretty big app space-wise on your phone, but it's like a field guide that you can take with you. Um, and then if you want to like document birds that you're seeing outside and keep track of lists and stuff, they also have a tool called eBird, which is an app and an online uh, app you can use so that can help you keep track of checklists and see what birds are in your area and you're contributing to science by s submitting those sightings. Thanks Rachel. Um, this next question is for Joe from Makale. Why would a bird uh, like my porch and what is it looking for? <laughs> okay well there could be several things going on there. One it could be looking for a place to nest. It could be looking for a safe retreat from predators. It could be looking for shade. Uh, it could be attracted by uh, um, its reflections in, in the windows uh, underneath the porch. Uh, it could, um, uh, hummers, if it's a hummingbird, could may be attracted by if there's any red, red paint or anything that's, that's red on the porch. It could be another, another thing. It could be a good vantage point from which to view food opportunities uh, and or enemies, danger. All right. Many, many different reasons for liking yep. that porch. Mm -hmm. um, this next question is for Rachel. Jesse asks, why are male birds more colorful? Yeah, so I will say, first of all, they aren't always. A lot of species are nearly identical or maybe the only difference is their size or something like that. Um, so it's not always true, but a lot of the songbirds we're familiar with, they do have differences in the sexes. And that's a fancy word I'll teach you called sexual dimorphism, which means die, there's two morphs, shapes or colors or something. And so um, often it's because, you know, birds see amazing colors. And uh, it's very attractive to a bird to have a lot of bright colors. It can also be really dangerous for birds that are sitting on the nest to have uh, bright colors. So often in birds that have that dimorphism, they do take different roles in rearing the children. Either the female does it alone or the male will help feed and protect the babies but won't incubate the eggs, for example. And so sometimes the roles they have can make that difference too. Um, but often the ones that are identical, like they just kind of do the same things. <laughs> they might work in cooperation to raise their young. So it doesn't really matter if one is more brightly colored than the other. Um, and remember there's sometimes hidden traits that can make male birds more colorful than the females that we can't see with our own eyes. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question for you again, Rachel from Mariah. How will climate change affect birds? And this is so, so cool because um, birds are going to be some of the first animals really affected um, in more ways than you realize because uh, they migrate so many times. So there might be birds here in Kansas, like uh, certain sparrows, fox sparrows and things like that that are here in the winter, but in the summer, they're in the Arctic. And so that long distance migration means that, you know, for some birds that might be doing okay here in Kansas, um, their nesting habitat might not have the right kinds of insects emerging at the right time to feed their young. Um, they, they might be seeing changes in the snow melt covering some of their resources. Um, changes in fish communities can affect a lot of the seabirds. So, so birds are affected in very complex ways. And because birds are so interconnected across continents and across the globe sometimes, um, they're a really good indicator for climate change studies. So I, I personally know a lot of researchers who have done work in the Arctic on birds. I've done work in the Arctic on climate change with birds. And a lot of the birds that I saw up there were birds from Kansas that just spend their summer up in the Arctic. Um, and, and so that makes them a really unique opportunity for us to study the effects of climate change. Terrific. Um, all right, my friends, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for another uh, student town hall and to everyone who submitted their questions. Um, and of course, we appreciate our um, guests, Joe Santiago and Rachel Roth for answering our questions. Um, so let me just let me present. So our next um, topic, our next town hall is going to be animal behavior. And um, so you should start sending in your uh, questions now at biobus.org backslash town hall. 
Um, we'll see you live next Thursday, July 23rd to learn new things about how animals behave. And if you want to do uh, more science, um, check out our Explore at Home Science Challenges, especially this one um, on um, investigating bird behavior from your window. And um, find out more info at www.biobus.org and follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook using our handle at Biobus to keep discovering at home with us. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.